Well, good morning, everybody. Um, first, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which Monash University's Australian campuses stand. I also wish to acknowledge members of the diplomatic corps who are present either virtually, you're gonna hear from one of them in a moment, or in person during this conference. First of all, His Excellency, Mr. Radis Stefanovic, the ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary of the Republic of Serbia to the Commonwealth of Australia. Mr. Fedja Zlobek, deputy head of delegation and head of the political press and information department, delegation of the European Union to Australia. And Mr. Steph Lysart, Consul General of the United Kingdom to South Australia, Tasmania and Victoria. Distinguished members of faculty who are here and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Jean Monnet Procam, that's the Project on Comparative Migration Conference on Borders, Labour and Mobility, the European Union and Australia Compared. I'm just gonna make a few opening remarks before I introduce you to our first speaker, Mr. Fedja Fied Zlobek from the, Euro the delegation of the European Union to Australia, just to maybe contextualize what our conference over the next two days will be about. First of all, growth in the number of international migrants had remained stable throughout the last two decades. By 2020, 281 million people were living outside their country of origin, in contrast with 173 million in 2000 and 221 million in 2010. International migrants represent about 3.6% of the world's population currently. However, UN agencies reported that due to COVID-19, international migration growth slowed by 27% or 2 million migrants in 2020 alone. In the first half of 2020, as the COVID pandemic spread and states shut their borders, refugee resettlements globally fell 69% from, six, from 20, 2019 levels, um, UN data showed. In March 2020, the UNHCR and IOM announced that they would both suspend refugee resettlement travel for, quote, as long as it remains necessary. But this didn't stop people flows. Two years ago this month, in August 2020, the UK government ordered its armed forces to assist in dealing with the increase in the number of boats crossing the English Channel carrying migrants from France. In Greece, the government turned back thousands of migrants from Turkey. The EU also sought to stem refugee and migration inflows, paying billions of euro to African states to prevent people movements and border crossings. COVID then not only closed borders in 2020, it also created simultaneously a food security crisis in many countries. Indeed, the Organization for Migration and the World Food Programme both concluded that, quote, no country had been spared. So not just developing countries, but developed countries as well. Connecting global hunger with displacement. The World Food Programme estimated that double the 2019 figure, 135 million people, rising to 270 million in 2020, were acutely food insecure by the end of 2020. 2019 had been a record year. Of total migrants entering the OECD in 2017, almost 600,000 held permanent visas, while 4.9 million entered countries on temporary visas. Year on year, the rate of temporary migration growth to the OECD doubled. With temporary migration, the constant churn of migrant workers is a structural component of international immigration. 
Studies have also increasingly pointed to the partial exclusion of migrants from the formal economy and work rights. In Australia, for example, the farm sector has been a particular focus of wage theft, the university sector as well, I should add, or inadequate protection for migrant workers. However, there are very few sectors in Australia or the European Union where this is not the case. Other core issues that arise, particularly within the gig economy, are the precarious nature of low-wage, low-skill work. The short-term policy response to the COVID-19 pandemic in the OECD was to shut down major sectors of national economies and lock down employees, leaving temporary migrant workers with little or no access to schemes designed to support people who were no longer employed in COVID-affected industries, such as hospitality and tourism. Undocumented workers were similarly affected. Avoidance of the formal economy frequently leads to exploitation, violence and crime against undocumented migrants. Studies of the European Economic Area suggest that only a very small proportion of crimes committed against undocumented migrants are reported to authorities. Some reforms, such as in France, Italy, Portugal and Spain, grant undocumented migrants children access to health care. But this does not necessarily result in improved healthcare outcomes for children due to the potential deportation that may be imposed upon individuals or families. For example, in Germany, medical professionals are required by law to share information on undocumented uh, patients with immigration authorities. The UK followed similar procedures prior to Brexit, but abolished this prior to just prior to leaving the European Union. Um, by requiring medical professionals not to share private data with immigration authorities. But consequently, many OECD temporary and undocumented workers were compelled to return to their countries of origin as a consequence of COVID. This also produced major effects upon migration source countries, which experienced severe impacts in terms of economic welfare, unemployment and mobility restrictions, the aggregate of which compounded the COVID effect upon national economies in developing countries, which also had a particular impact upon those countries with marginal access to vaccines when they became available. The future of migrant mobility in the post-COVID era cannot be taken for granted, and this could have a substantial effect on both types and breadth of formal transnational mobility regimes. Although mode four of the general agreement um, of the GATS agreement allows for the move, this is the trade and services agreement, the GATS agreement, allows for the movement of natural persons for the supply of services in another country. GATS does not cover natural persons seeking access to the employment market, measures regarding citizenship, residence, or employment on a permanent basis. And governments continue to possess the autonomy, of course, to regulate entry and temporary stays. So the free movement of services provided by natural persons under the WTO does not necessarily encroach upon individual states' abilities to allow access of workers to their markets. So mode four excludes access to labour market citizenship and permanent employment, if a state so wishes, and mode four covers only temporary entry and stay in a WTO member's territory to supply services. An estimated 5.3 million undocumented workers were living in the EU in 2016, or approximately 1% of the total European Economic Area, EU plus EFTA, population. Undocumented workers tend to avoid usage of state or welfare services. Over two thirds of all of the EU's undocumented workers in 2017 were living in Germany, the UK, France, um, and Italy. Perhaps surprisingly, the largest source of undocumented migrants by citizenship to the European economic area came from the Asia Pacific region, comprising 30% of the 2017 total. In Britain, this totaled a remarkable 52%, with undocumented Europeans comprising only 6% of the UK's total. Conversely, Europe was the largest source of undocumented migration, that is, non-EU Europe, of undocumented migration to Germany, comprising 32% of the German total. In both the European Economic Area and Germany, more than half of undocumented migrants had possessed short-stay authorization of less than five years and had overstayed their visas, 
or were asylum seekers awaiting case outcomes. Britain was again the outlier, with 36% having held residence in the UK for 10 years or more. EU and EFTA citizens have held contradictory, although consistent, views about undocumented migration. On the one hand, the majority of EEA citizens support the deportation of undocumented migrant workers. On the other hand, the majority also support the admission of refugees. Although many refugees enter the European economic area unauthorised and undocumented and may claim asylum. In Australia, the October federal budget, yes, the second federal budget that Australia is having this year, when one is barely enough, is expected to increase the non-humanitarian permanent migrant intake to 200,000 and increase from its current level of 160,000. Australia's non-humanitarian migrant intake has previously never exceeded 190,000 with an additional 1,300, 750 places, 13,000, I should say, 750 places set aside for humanitarian migration. The Albanese government has also promised to speed up processing of 570,000 temporary visa applications that are currently awaiting approval. Consequently, Australia in 2023 is likely to undertake its largest ever intake of net overseas migrants, eclipsing the all-time record of 316,000 persons in 2008 under Kevin Rudd's government. The collapse in immigration during the COVID pandemic is the main factor behind Australia's unemployment rate of 3.4%, a 48-year low. Australia transitioned from importing 180,000 plus workers every year via immigration pre-COVID to losing thousands of migrant workers throughout the pandemic. Had pre-COVID levels of immigration continued through the pandemic, there would be approximately 400,000 more workers in the Australian economy currently. There are clear policy and practical benefits from clear, carefully targeted immigration and humanitarian programs. Immigration leads to diverse and vibrant communities, skilled and adaptive and efficient workforces that build and consolidate national and regional prosperity. Immigration not only expands economies, but it also builds diaspora networks, encourages innovation and investment and deepens networks of trade relationships globally. Both the EU and Australia compete for skilled migrants in a world of scarcity where knowledge-based economies are essential to the competitiveness of nations in the 21st century. I promise you, I've come to the last page. At this Jean Monnet Procam conference, we will hear perspectives from Europe, Australia, and North America, from Asia, from Eurasia, and New Zealand on migration, mobility, and humanitarian assistance, and the significant policy challenges these issues present, even as numerous political parties throughout the OECD call for more protectionism, deglobalization, and closed borders. We will hear perspectives from practitioners, researchers, and policy professionals who deal with these issues every day. Our topics include digitization of borders, refugee crossings of the Mediterranean, the labour market impacts of Brexit, migration policy in Italy and Germany, the impact of the EU's common migration policy, migrant workplace violations, intra-EU migration effects in Portugal, um, in, uh, sorry, in uh, the Asia, uh, in, in uh, the EU, Portugal, India and China's impact on global migration governance. Australia's engagement with the Asia-Pacific region through labour mobility policies, the impact of the Ukraine war, attitudes towards migration in Switzerland, people inflows and border crossings in the Balkans, and I have barely scratched the surface in mentioning these topics. We'll hear perspectives from the Red Cross and the Refugee Council. We'll learn perspectives from policy practitioners from the EU delegation, who is about to speak, to Australia, the EU Commission's Directorate General for Migration and Home Affairs, the Serbian experience as a destination and transit country, and the UK's post-Brexit immigration policy. On behalf of the organising committee, I welcome everybody to Melbourne and to Monash University. We're proud of this conference program. We encourage you to seek out other presenters and build dialogue and networks with them. As this is a Jean Monnet conference, I might conclude with, well, three, not two, three quotations from Jean Monnet himself, which are very apposite to the topics we're about to discuss. The first is build union among people, not cooperation between states. Make people work together, show them that beyond their difference and geographical boundaries, there lies a common interest. 
And for those of you who don't know, Jean Monnet was not only the first Secretary General of the League of Nations, the first President of the European Commission, and well known as a Rothschild banker, but he also came from a long line of a cognac making family. And since we are in Melbourne in the pouring rain, we would do well to recall Monet's famous aphorism. The great thing about making cognac is that it teaches you above everything else to wait. The seasons have got to be on your side. Well, there are three things you can do in your life. You can win, you can lose, or it can rain. So thank you and uh, welcome to this morning's session.